fill us in a bit. Wait, wait, what was your first band? It was the St. Louis Union, which was a, started off as a, a blues soul band and, and due to, the, to being very young as a band and the times, the whole mod thing happened and we kind of, I suppose, shifted and became slicker and still had that very strong soul edge to us, but we became known as you know, a big mod band. Uh, came out with Twisted Wheel, which obviously the whole mod thing in Manchester emanated from there. So yeah, that was uh, you know pop star at nineteen, washed up by twenty. You know, so uh, when you released singles. Did you get out an album? No, we never did. We just released uh, uh, three singles and, and obviously B sides and two or three other songs that didn't come out, but now have appeared on various bootlegs. And, and now they're, they're cult. They're, they're, now, yes. The yes freak, cult status. It's called Freak Beat now, ah, strangely. Oh, it's it wasn't called that then. Yeah, were you a freak at the time, do you think? Uh, absolutely not, no. <laughs> yeah. And when did that finish? Uh, six, end of 66. Right, when did you go after that? After that, I kind of went into a, a bit of a, became a bit of a recluse, I think, for a year. I was quite shattered by the whole thing falling apart. You were young. Yeah, it was hard to Very take. Young. It was hard to take, uh, and I don't know if it was the time. If I'd have been 20 in the 80s, maybe it'd have been different. Who knows? Who cares? The point is that it took me two or three years to really get back to doing something I felt I wanted to do again. Uh, and I had this strange period where I was just working, doing sessions, not actually with a band as such, just doing different things. But I got to play with some really interesting people like Jimmy Ruffin. I was Jimmy Ruffin's MD for a while. And I, and I played, did a gig with Roland Kirk and just mad things happened, you know, just because we were in a weird situation doing clubs in the northeast and it was a mad time. Sure. But it gave me a lot of playing experience. Uh, but in about 71, I, <clears throat> 72, I encountered for the first time a mini Moog and that sort of set me on a totally different track of thinking. Because uh, it had just been Fender Rhodes and Hammond organs up to that point. Sure. Where did you encounter it? At this studio in Pointer, right. I was doing a session. There was this crazy guy uh, who was obsessed with Egyptology, and he, he he actually became quite famous. He presented a couple of TV series on. It was a big series on Egyptology. Right. He was mad as a hatter. Nice guy though. Uh, <laughs> it's called Dave Roll. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I can't remember the name of the band. Anyway, Mini, Mini Moog was great. It was just in the studio and I just messed about with it in the time I was there, a couple of times I went. And I just thought, I've got to get these. But it was about 1,500 quid in 1972, which was a ridiculous amount of money, of course. Uh, so it was 75, 76 before I was able to, uh, well, I got the ARP. Uh, so I kind of had that about 18 months before I joined magazine. Didn't, it didn't come with a manual, it was second hand. Some lads in Blackburn, I bought it off quite cheaply. Uh, so I kind of learnt it just by messing about with it, which was a good way to learn. When magazine came along, it was the ARP, Hammond organ, Hammond organ. Fender Rhodes. Right. Uh, it was bad enough having a keyboard player at that point in time, sure. just the whole punk thing being so fresh. So I thought, I probably need to get rid of the Fender Rhodes because it's so associated with that whole, you know, fusion stuff and what have you. Uh, and the Hammond, so I, I swapped, uh, I swapped them for a, a Yamaha organ, but kept the Leslie and uh, got a Yamaha electric band. But I only really, really found my way into the Odyssey synth by being with magazine because there was a real reason to do something with it. Sure. Prior to that, I was just messing about, you know, at home really. Right. Um, I was uh, sharing a flat with Martin Hanna, and uh, he. You know, I'd known him since 74, something like that. We'd done a bit of playing together on various things. Uh, and he'd always wanted to be a record producer. He was a massive Spectre fan. And, then, and you know, the idea of being a record producer in 74 was like becoming, playing for United or something. It was a big dream that very rarely happened for anyone. But he stuck with it. And uh, he came to me, uh, I'd moved out of Manchester. Uh, and uh, I was in Manchester, back in Manchester, moved back to Presswich, that's right. And he gave me a ring and said, Dave, I've, I've actually, started record, recording people and he said John I want you to listen to these two records I've made two EPs so he, he put one on and then put the other on and said which one do you like so I said I like the second one and he said oh right okay good and it was Slaughter and the Dogs first EP and Spiral Scratch all oh, right so sure luckily sure. I said Spiral Scratch yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
they were like glam rock really slaughtering the dogs you know yeah. in a way 